What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. So recently I have been on a sort of a kick thinking of different force multiplying weapons and equipment that are available to the average citizen to help outfit a partisan infantry style squad for the purposes of what the second amendment is meant for. And it ain't killing deer. Now, I'm not sure how many of you guys realize how good we actually kind of have it here in the United States, at least compared to elsewhere in the world, especially in Europe, even the more gun friendly European countries like Finland, for example, I've been there twice and that's a very gun friendly European country, but even they have to jump through a bunch more hoops than we have to here. There are a few things in Finland that are easier to acquire, like suppressors. Like suppressors you can just buy at a gun shop in Finland, like no problem. But the actual gun itself is harder to get. You have to like prove that it's for sporting purposes and that you know, you're part of a shooting club. But elsewhere in Europe, you know, it's even worse than that. Some places you can't own guns at all. Some places you can't own a knife. So we actually have it pretty decent for the most part here in the United States. But even with that, the military has access to a lot of things that the average citizen simply can't get their hands on. Uh, one example are machine guns for the most part. I'm tracking you can get like an SOT, which that comes with its own drawbacks because like you're under the ATF's thumb even more than usual. Or if you have tons of money, you can get yourself a transferable machine gun. But for the most part, without crime, machine guns, at least modern machine guns, are inaccessible to the average citizen. Another type of weapon that's pretty inaccessible are military issue type of explosives. So I know there's a lot of stuff, if you use your imagination, that can be sort of replicated on the civilian, and I'm not telling you to do so, but in Minecraft. But I'm talking about like your hand thrones, like your frag grenades or launchables like 40 millimeter HEDP or anti-tank stuff or mines such as claymores. I'm also tracking that we have access to like 37 millimeter flare launchers and stuff like that, but it's still not, you know, HEDP. Uh, there are some stuff on the civilian end that's pretty close, at least to like flashbang grenades and stuff like that. Some of the airsoft like pyrotechnics are pretty gnarly, but when it comes to actual like killing explosives, at least on the military issued end, we can't get it. Now, before we get into it any further today, guys, I just wanna mention that today's video is sponsored by Venture Surplus. It's the number one place you wanna go for any of your military surplus needs, specifically US surplus, and it is where I picked up this TAPS rig that you see here, and hindsight is 2020, but this is the rig that I should have been wearing in today's video because this is the exact same chest rig that Marines use to carry all of the ammunition for their IIR, so. No duh. They also have a ton of cool uniforms as well as pouches on their website. So maybe you're trying to build out like a legacy GWAT kit for either LARPing at the range or for a Milsom event, Venture Surplus has what you need. They also have a ton of legit medical gear from North American Rescue, from tourniquets all the way up to fully built out IFAX. So if you're lacking medical gear, Venture Surplus has your back. Now they also want me to let you know that I have a discount code for you guys. If you go to the website and use code BLUEGENE10 at checkout, it gets you 10% off your order there, but they also have a 50% off sale going on right now for this month until the 15th, so March of 2024. So if you go to the website, it's 50% off, plus an additional 10% off if you use my code. There's no excuse, go to the website, take advantage of the deals, get yourself some awesome military surplus, medical gear, or maybe you're one of those guys that shows up to my layouts at Milsom West and you have like a clear plastic disposable poncho from Walmart, get yourself at least a, like a legit poncho while you're there. So big thank you to Venture Surplus. Now let's get back in this video. Now as a partisan force, you're not gonna be doing a lot of missions that the military takes for granted, right? You're not gonna be doing a lot of direct action raids um, against a hardened target. You know, you're not gonna be getting kitted out with your boys, with your plate carriers and your helmets and your vans and your Mark 18s and rolling up in a Tacoma on the X because that would be a very good way to die. Instead, you're gonna be doing a lot of stuff probably on your own or with a small group of individuals and the types of missions you would be doing if you're going to be act taking any type of deadly action would be to actually like take out key individuals from range and then getting away. Now, another type of action I believe a partisan force 
would be involved in and wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility would be very violent, very quick um, ambushes. Because as a partisan force, you're gonna be outnumbered, you're gonna be outgunned, so you wanna get what you need to get done and then get the heck out of there. Now, as a result of these different types of missions, I definitely think that there are certain weapons that lend themselves better to this type of stuff, better than others. And I don't think that there's any argument that the rifle that you should be choosing here in the United States is an AR-15. It's America's gun, there are tons of them out there, and there's this old saying like, if there are 10 houses near you, seven of them probably have an AR in it, as well as ammo. So the AR-15 is definitely the number one choice for you know any type of fighting force here in the United States. And it kind of pains me to say that because I'm an AK guy at heart, I love the Kalashnikov platform, but I would be fooling myself if I said it was the superior option for a guerrilla force here in the United States. Now, going back to the discussion on different types of weapons that are afforded to the military, but average citizens can't get, and specifically machine guns. Um, would I love to own an M249 saw, like a fully automatic one? Yes, like who wouldn't? I, I was a saw gunner when I was in the military and being able to own one of those things would be freaking awesome. But would that be the right type of LMG if I was to try to outfit a guerrilla force here in the United States? Probably not. Now the reason for this guys is because if I have a group of individuals with me, and let's say like my little war band and everybody has ARs and I'm the only guy with a saw because somehow I had one before shit kicked off or whatever, how am I actually going to you know, keep that thing running and fed? Now I know you're gonna say like, hey, the saw shoots 5.56. AR-15 shoot 5.56, so there should be some type of ammo interchangeability there. Yes, there is, like I could definitely take 5.56 or maybe 2.23, I'm not sure how well 2.23 would run out of a saw, I've never tried it before. But yeah, I could take ammo from them and link it up and run it through that saw, probably without any issues. But the bigger issue comes with the links. So belt-fed machine guns feed through links. They don't take magazines. I know that the saw can take a magazine, but like that is not how it's supposed to be ran. It's supposed to be ran through a belt. And you can use that belt, and I know you're gonna say like, hey, can't you just like reuse the links? Yes, but it's definitely not what you wanna do. Um, you do not wanna reuse links if you're trying to use a gun for combat. It is not recommended because once you use those links, it's gonna cause you issues in that gun if you try reusing those links that you've already spent. Uh, trust me, I was a saw gunner. I know the ins and outs of that gun and the different problems that come along with it. And another problem with it is spare parts. So if that saw breaks, and I guarantee you it will, uh, how are you gonna replace parts on that gun? Instead, it might be a smarter decision to go more the IAR route, so the infantry automatic rifle. And that is where the gun that we're gonna be talking about today comes in. This is the Red Right Hand Recce LMG. This is a purpose-built AR-15 for the infantry automatic rifle role, specifically for the citizen. And honestly, this is one of the most, I hate to say it, based ARs that I've ever seen and have used. I have absolutely fell in love with this gun. And quite honestly, this rifle fits the role of a Carson Force here in the United States better than I'd say any other AR-15 out there. One thing to note on this gun is you guys might notice compared to all of my different rifles, uh, this thing is not painted, it is black. And the reason for that is because this is not my rifle. Sadly, I actually fell in love with this gun, but sadly I have to take the, they actually, um, Red Right Hand sent me the upper on this. So I do have to send it back, it is not mine. So that is why it is black and all the attachments on it are painted. Now the reason why this rifle is called the Recce LMG, and I know Recce is sort of like a marketing term, but the reason why they chose that name is because this was actually heavily inspired by the Cell Scouts uh, during the Rhodesian Bush War because those guys really wrote the doctrine of what it meant to be like a, you know, underfunded, small, partisan force operating behind enemy lines. And one of their favorite weapons that they would take out is the RPK. So the old long barrel 762 by 39 RPK. And the reason for that is because that was their choice of a auto rifle. And it provided a lot of firepower. It shared common ammunition from where they were operating at. And that was the same principle behind 
this rifle right here because this does provide auto rifle capabilities um, just due to how it's set up, which we'll go into here. And it shares common ammunition and parts with the mass majority of guns here in the United States, which are all ARs. Now, even though the Rhodesians love the RPK, they are definitely not the first ones to use IARs. Um, the IAR concept started all the way back in World War I towards the end with the BAR. There's probably guns before that, but here in the United States, famously, the Browning automatic rifle was used at the end of World War I somewhat, but all throughout World War II through Korea and then started to kind of peter off during Vietnam with the M14 being brought into service very shortly before it was replaced by the M16 where the M14 was designed to replace both the BAR and the M1 Garand because it was also automatic. It kind of failed uh, miserably at that, but it's kind of cool to see a resurgence in this concept um, as of late. And then one thing I will say, when I was in the military, and I've mentioned this school before, the uh, Marine Mountain Warfare Training School, you know, I was not a Marine, I was a Ranger. And when I went to that school, I was a saw gunner. And I remember seeing Marines there, and it was like the one time I actually interacted with Marines my entire time in the military. And I remember seeing a guy there who had his uh, M27 IAR, and he had like a chest rack full of magazines. And I remember looking at him, I'm like, what the hell is he doing? I remember like my platoon sergeant saying like, did we not learn our lesson from World War II? And it really didn't make sense to me of why an infantry unit would want to do that. And still I'm kind of wrestling with that for the well-supplied military force to uh, use an IAR in the world of belt-fed machine guns. But for the role of the armed citizen with no government funding, I think that the IAR makes way more sense in modern times. And maybe that lack of government funding is why the Marines do it too. Oh! Now getting into the rifle here, we're gonna go in a tip to butt fashion as Grantham has made the standard on gun tube. Start off with the barrel here. It's gonna quickly go over the muzzle device here. It is obviously an A2 flash hider. So this is the flash hider that came with the upper. It's not the best, it's not the worst. It's kind of the gold standard of what a flash hider should do. And obviously you can swap this thing out for any type of muzzle device that you have. If you wanna mount a suppressor to this thing, which is another huge asset to a you know, partisan force because it's gonna reduce your signature in an area. And the more violence you put on something without everyone else knowing, the better, because it's gonna give you a better chance of escaping. It's not gonna make you silent, but it is gonna reduce your signature in an area. Now being able to mount a suppressor on this thing would increase its capabilities even more. And it actually has an adjustable gas system here. So it has, I believe, 12 different settings. It's right now it's on setting number six. Uh, I didn't fuck with it at all. That is the setting that the, game, the gun came with and I just left it there and it just ran completely fine. But if you mount a suppressor on this thing, obviously it's gonna send more gas back through the system. It's not gonna be too bad since it's a rifle length barrel. It's got a 20 inch barrel on here, but depending on the suppressor you're using and the ammo, you can adjust this gas system up here and you can finally tune this thing to run whatever you got. Now going into the barrel here, this is where things get very interesting with this rifle. So again, it is a 20 inch barrel. Now, the reason why a 20 inch barrel is so cool for this particular rifle is because of what a 20 inch barrel does. The 5.56 five, round or 223 was designed from the ground up to be ran through a 20 inch barrel. I believe that is where 5.56 five, is at its peak. I'm not sure if you get like diminishing returns if you have a longer barrel than 20 inches. I'm not even sure if they do sell barrels that are longer than this, but 20 inches is what Eugene Stoner had in mind when designing the round and what it is meant to do. So out of this type of barrel, 5.56 five, is cook it. And 5.56 five, is a round that is heavily dependent on speed for lethality. And I know 5.56 five, out of like a short barreled AR will definitely kill people but it is not as optimal as it is out of a 20 inch barrel. And there's a saying that out of a 20 inch barrel, uh, training ammo becomes duty ammo. So 55 grain, 5.56 five, out of this barrel is gonna be freaking great. It is gonna get all the cavitation that you want out of a 5.56 five, round. Now another added benefit of the velocity that you're getting out of this barrel is its ability to penetrate armor. So it is 2024, most combatants out there have body armor. Even the guys like Hamas, they're wearing body armor. So the ability to penetrate body armor 
with a common round here in the United States, even like your cheapo training ammunition, I think it's a huge asset for a partisan force. Now, other than the length, this barrel also has girth. It is a heavy profile, it's an H-bar barrel. So it is gonna be very accurate, especially under sustained fire. This is supposed to be an infantry automatic rifle where you're gonna be dumping rounds out of this thing. And if you're putting a lot of rounds down range, if you don't have a barrel that's up to the task, you're gonna suffer from accuracy problems or even, you know, maybe exploding. Now there are certain barrels that are not H-bar barrels, like this SOCOM profile barrel that is present on this M4A1 or like the Block 2, where these barrels are meant to be able to uh, withstand a decent amount of sustained fire and, on, and automatic fire in case you need to like break contact or something like that. These SOCOM profile barrels, like in this rifle, even though they're not super light, are up to that task. The only issue with this is the gas system in here, uh, where these might end up bursting just due to the curve in the gas system, specifically right here, because where that curve is, there's a, it creates a kink. So when this thing starts heating up, this area right here is gonna heat up more than any other area on here. So this is where this would burst on here, but the barrel itself should be able to be up to the task and uh, might be able to fill the auto rifle role in some ways, but definitely not as good as this rifle right here, especially with the gas system that is in this rifle, which we'll go into here shortly. But with an H-bar barrel like you see on this rifle, you're not gonna suffer from any type of accuracy loss when you get this thing super hot, because that is what H-bar barrels are very good at. And the one downside to an H-bar barrel though, is that it is gonna retain its heat longer than any of the other barrels are because it has more surface area and more material that is absorbing that heat. But one thing that Red Right Hand did for this barrel and for this gun is that they have heat sinks, aluminum heat sinks all up and down the barrel here underneath the handguard. And what these aluminum heat sinks are doing is absorbing the heat from the barrel. So even though you know the handguard and those aluminum heat sinks are gonna get very hot, um, it's not gonna keep everything up here cooler, the actual barrel is gonna maintain a cooler temperature than if they didn't have it. With this rifle, you're gonna be able to put down a lot of firepower very accurately downrange at a great distance. And I mentioned earlier in this video, one of the missions of a guerrilla force would be you know, sniping, um, lone sniper type of stuff. And this rifle would be able to do that as well in spades. You have a 20 inch H-bar free floated barrel out of an AR-15, and you're just gonna be launching 5.56 rounds very accurately with this thing. So it's really cool that this rifle can fit a wide variety of roles. So if you wanted this thing to be an LMG type of rifle, you can do that and put down suppressive fire. If you wanna put a nicer optic on this thing and use it as an SPR, you can do that as well. Now I mentioned earlier that the standard M4 gas system has a tendency to burst in this specific area right here, um, if it is put under too much stress, like if I were to push this rifle to its absolute limit, it has the potential to burst right there. Now, one thing that Red Right Hand did to help mitigate this is instead of having a curve in the gas system, that which is typical, they have a completely straight gas tube in here. This makes it so that there are absolutely zero kinks, so it will heat up very evenly throughout the entire system. Even more cool than the straight gas tube is that they also added, just like they did on the barrel, a heat sink wrapped around the gas tube here. So just like it does on the barrel, it's gonna help absorb that heat out of the gas tube so the gas tube is not gonna get nearly as hot as if it didn't have the heat sink. The specialized gas tube as well as the barrel makes this thing a powerhouse to just like your average Joe on a platform that is pretty familiar to most gun guys here in the United States, if not all. Now, as far as the handguard that is on this particular rifle, they have a couple different versions that are out there, but this one's the quad rail version, which I'm a huge fan of quad rails, as you can probably tell. But this was a Midwest Industries uh, quad rail on here, and all of the stuff, so like the H-bar uh, barrel, the heat sinks on both the gas tube as well as the barrel are all shoved underneath this handguard and I do enjoy the quad rail. It does make this barrel or this gun incredibly heavy. This is not a light gun, especially when you have the bipod mounted on here, which um, I do like the bipod for specific things, but for the most part, if I was gonna walk around with this thing, I would probably have 
the bipod detached, maybe put in the ruck or something like that. And if I needed to actually do like a ambush or use this thing as an SPR, I would attach the bipod on here. I generally don't run bipods on guns, but I have it on here for demonstration. Um, but for the most part, I would probably keep it off because this is not a light gun, like I said. Um, it does require a little bit of strength, but for the capability that this rifle provides, I think that the weight is well justified. Now, along with the upper, red right hand also provided a thousand rounds of 5.56 with this gun for me to shoot, uh, which I'm very grateful for. I wish more uh, gun companies did that when they sent me guns to test out. Um, Klashnikov USA also did that. So I really like the trend that's going here. If you want me to review guns, send ammo, please. Also guys, I wanna quickly mention Badlands Ammunition. Um, they didn't provide ammo for this particular review, but they are a huge support of the channel. If you want really good ammo, go to the website and use code BLUEGENE at checkout. It gets you a discount there and also helps me out because the more ammo you guys buy, the more ammo they're willing to send me. So go check out Badlands Ammunition. Now along with the upper and the ammunition, Red Right Hand also provided this Fostec trigger. So this thing is pretty badass. It actually has three different genders. It has safe, non-binary, and binary mode. <laughs> so it has safe, it has semi-automatic, so like a, how a normal AR-15 would shoot and where fully automatic would be, and it has binary mode. So it's somewhat like fully automatic. It takes a little bit of a learning curve. I'm still kind of learning how to run it myself, but when you get good at it, it really does mimic fully automatic fire quite well. And you can put a lot of firepower downrange, especially if you have this thing on bipod, you can put very accurate rounds in a very accurate cone of fire with this thing, even with this binary trigger on here. Again, it's not as good as fully automatic. It's not as easy to use, but with some training, you can be very accurate with this thing. Now, I think this trigger is pretty badass, and I think it provides a lot of capability for that IAR role, but the semi-automatic position, I will say, is not as good as pretty much any of the other triggers I felt on most ARs. Um, definitely not as good as like the Geisley triggers I have in this block two right here. And the closest thing I can equate it to is it feels like, it kind of feels like an AK trigger, uh, to be honest, which is not bad, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's it, it has that kind of like mushy feel to it versus like a Geisley trigger. You have very clear take up and then a wall and then Nothing beats that, I love guys' triggers. So if you're trying to use this rifle for more of like an SPR role, I would probably recommend swapping the lower for something that has more of a precise trigger on it. But you know, it is serviceable and most things can be overcome with training. So, you know, I don't hate it, but I don't love it either. The lower that I have on this rifle is actually just like a PSA lower. It was the only black lower that I have, but it actually kind of demonstrates how versatile an AR-15 is, so if I had this upper, I can put it on any type of lower I have, and it'll work just fine. Other than that, the rifle is set up pretty similarly to how I have most of my other rifles out here. One new thing that I have right here is this new overbore systems mount right here, which I have my EOTech on, as well as this primary arms magnifier. And what I like about this is because before, I had like separate risers for both, but with this kind of like boat-shaped riser right here, I can fit both the EOTech up front here as well as the magnifier back here so I don't have to buy two separate things. But other than that, guys, that's all I got. I think that this rifle is freaking fantastic and is one of the, again, one of the most like base rifles I could think of that is specifically designed to increase the firepower of a citizen fighting force. I think that is freaking cool as hell. And the amount of thought process that went into making this gun I think it's cool. You don't really see that that much from a lot of AR-15 manufacturers out there. There are a ton of AR manufacturers out there, but there are a few that are kind of like doing something a little bit different and pushing the envelope on AR. For a while there, we're seeing guns like getting super light, but it's really cool to see it kind of go in the opposite direction, uh, making 20 inch barrels cool. And honestly, after shooting this thing and just thinking about it the most, like which barrel length makes most sense and which provides the most capability to a civilian fighting force. And I think that a 20 inch barrel H-bar um, with this gun fits the role better than most others. Um, honestly, like, you know, a rifle like this, a 14.5 is great as well, but man, 
like the capability that you're getting out of this gun is, I can't really think of a gun that does anything better than it for the purposes of a um, partisan force here in the United States. That's all I got for you guys. That is the Red Right Hand Recce LMG, one of the most badass rifles I've shot in a very long time. And if there's another rifle that you think, or weapon that you think adds a level of capability to a civilian fighting force, please let me know down in the comments. I'm always interested in seeing what you guys have to say and maybe I'll check some of that stuff out. But hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. You can also follow me on Instagram at BlueGeneOperator or go to my website, thebluegeneoperator.com to find school shirts and merch, which helps out the channel. Also guys, if you wanna get involved with the channel even more directly, I got Patreon, helps me buy guns, gear, ammo, all the kind of stuff that goes into running a gun channel. And it'll get you access to videos a little bit earlier than everyone else. But hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you guys next time.